hardest thing. Uh, it is absolutely the hardest thing to do. And the fact that we have 5 million people that are joining together to pray for Israel is a historic miracle. I'm telling you, to get the church to pray is a miracle. To get the church to pray for Israel is a total historic miracle. And so we, you know, as a leadership team, when I first heard this, we were stirred a little bit like, okay, God, are you calling us to join this? And after prayer, we felt like the Lord was saying, yes, pray for Israel. And so Mike challenged everyone that was, who was going to be involved to pray for Israel one hour a day for 21 days. And at first I was like, one hour a day for 21 days? I mean, I, I have a trouble playing one hour a week for Israel. And so, you know, how are we going to do that? I mean, my flesh kind of fought that. And so I was thinking, okay, Lord, what, what are you saying for us to do? And just as we waited on the Lord, we felt like the Lord was saying, no, I am calling you on an assignment as a church to stand in the gap for the nation of Israel for these 21 days. And so I, I believe that the Lord is calling us to join in and to participate in this. So I want to start with this message today is going to be, is titled, Why Pray for Israel? That's the question everyone has. Why? I mean, why are we going to do, why, why are we doing this? Why pray for Israel? Isn't God going to just do it uh, according to his word? I mean, why are we praying for Israel? And then the other question is, okay, why are we praying for Israel now? Why now? Why is it happening now? Why is, this, why is 5 million people all of a sudden joining in to pray for Israel now? Why? It's like this, this question, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have that question. Why pray for Israel and why pray for Israel now? So I hope to answer that question in this message. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak. I'm actually, so, okay, calm down. I'm going to speak for an hour and a half today. Okay, if you need any extra food, or we probably got some snacks at the break if you need some food, I'm going to speak for 45 minutes, and then I'm, we're going to take a five-minute break, and then I'm going to speak another 45 minutes. And, uh, and, you know, Anna was asking me that, why are you doing that? Why are you doing, why are you doing two messages? And here's the reason why. My goal is to get us ready for this assignment as a church. This is an assignment this is not just a Mike Bickle thing. We're trying to like copy Mike Bickle. This is an assignment from the Lord for this church to partner together with the nation, partner together with him for what he's about to do in the nation of Israel. And my goal in these two messages is to help get us stirred up because a lot of us probably haven't thought about Israel in years, if ever. And a lot of us are like, what, what is, I don't even understand, you know? So I want to really get us stirred up to understand why we're praying for Israel. And so my goal is these two messages is to hopefully kickstart us, be a catalyst to us, to give us God's heart for Israel so that we can be effective to hit the goal and to hit the mark as forerunners. This is a forerunner assignment that we would be forerunners in the place of prayer that would stand in the gap for the nation of Israel so God's purposes for that nation could be fulfilled. Amen. So that's, that's where we're going. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 62. And this is the, the scripture passage that uh, the Lord has highlighted for this time. Isaiah chapter 62 uh, starting in uh, verse 1, I'm just going to read these things to just, just to us to get our hearts stirred up. Isaiah 62. And the Lord is, is speaking. This is the, the burden of the Lord's heart. This is Isaiah prophesying. And he says, for Zion's sake. He's not talking about the church. Okay? He's talking about the nation of Israel. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. He's, again, he's not talking about the church here. A lot of people have made the terrible error called replacement theology to say that the church has replaced Israel and God's prophetic agenda. And a lot of times when they do that, they say, we've got all the promises, but none of the judgment. I don't think it works that way. Jerusalem means Jerusalem. Zion means Zion. In the Middle East, not the church. All right? So just to set the context right so we understand what Isaiah is saying, until her righteousness goes forth like brightness. You can feel the burden of Isaiah the prophet as the burden of the Lord's heart comes upon him. I will not keep silent. 
and I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. That has yet to be fulfilled, but it is going to be fulfilled. And many of us, I believe, some of us, I believe, are going to see it with our own eyes on this earth when Israel's salvation goes forth like a blazing torch into the nations. And when that happens, the nations will see your righteousness. Now, obviously, this is talking about the second coming of Christ. These things are not going to happen until the Lord returns. But I believe we're going to see significant movement of God in the nation of Israel before that. And I believe this fast is a catalyst for that. How, how can God not move heaven and earth when five million intercessors stand in the gap for the prophetic promises of Israel? The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The Lord says about Israel, it will no longer be said to you forsaken. See, when Rome destroyed Israel in 70 AD, all the people for almost 2,000 years said that that nation has been forsaken. God says it has not been forsaken. You shall not be called forsaken. And, then, and the nation said that land has been called desolate. And that land has become this desolation for almost 2,000 years. And God acted supernaturally in 1947 and 1948 after World War II to give the, one of the greatest miracles in modern day history, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. You will not be said desolate. Here's what the Lord says to her. Hear this. Hear the heart of God for the nation of Israel. My delight is in her. Now, that's, not, that's going to be fulfilled when the Lord returns, but that's the heart of God. The Lord says, I am going to be married to your land. Jesus Christ is not only going to be married to his bride, He's going to be married to that land. That is his land by covenant. That is the land of Jesus Christ by covenant. And to him, your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. That is an incredible vision. That is, the, that is when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. That burden, the burden of the Lord, is meant to fuel the next verse. On your walls, O Jerusalem. This is where we come in. On your walls, O Jerusalem. I have appointed watchmen. That's me, that's you. That's the body of Christ. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. I want to challenge us right now with that phrase. Take no rest for yourselves. Are you willing to make a sacrifice of your time and your energy and your convenience and your agenda and your schedule to be part of a historic moment, five million intercessors praying for the nation of Israel. That has never, ever happened in church history. Truly a historic moment. Are you willing to, to take no rest for yourselves, to give yourselves, to sacrifice your time and your energy, to stand in the gap and to pray for this nation with God's purposes in mind? Give him no rest until he establish and establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. What a beautiful promise. Jerusalem's not going to be a praise in the earth until Jesus Christ returns. But God is calling you and God is calling me to be those intercessors, to be those forerunners 
who are going to give God no rest until he makes and establishes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. I used to think when I first read that, that Lord gave me this calling over 20 years ago, and I used to think, okay, my call is to pray for the church to be a praise in the earth. I still had a replacement theology paradigm where I, I viewed what many people have believed throughout church history, that the church has replaced Israel in God's prophetic agenda. But when the Lord showed me, no, you're, you're, to call, you're called to pray for the nation of Israel in Jerusalem to be a praise in the earth, my, my whole paradigm shifted. I had no framework for any of that. But I don't believe this passage is, is just limited to praying for Israel, though it certainly includes it. It is a call for God to raise up a prayer army of forerunners who would, who would pray and stand in the gap for the, the Lord's second coming, for the bride to be made ready, for the great commission to be fulfilled, for revival to, be, to break out, and for Israel to come into her prophetic destiny. It's a, it is a massive call. I believe that's a, a primary, one of the calls that God has given to me and to our church is to be those intercessors who would pray, who would stand in the gap, who would remind God, who would say, God, fulfill your promises for the nation of Israel. Lord, make your bride ready. Lord, let the great commission be fulfilled. Lord, let revival break out and the spirit be poured out. So God is stirring. I believe even right now God is stirring some of you in this calling. You've probably, you may have never even thought about this calling. You may have never even thought, okay, I don't even have uh, any framework for this calling. But I believe, the Lord, I believe the Lord is calling people and stirring people in this hour right now with a fresh calling that God's calling you as a watchman for the nation of Israel. Now, I want to just say as we get started, like I said, um, back in 2006, I wrote a book about praying for Israel, and I began to train the church in how to pray for Israel, both in America and in Africa. And so what I'm going about to say is coming from a lot of experience, and it, 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 makes, it makes talking about Israel somewhat challenging, because you may not realize this, I know this, is every single one of you have a different opinion about Israel. Every one of you have a opi different opinion about Israel. And it makes it challenging as a speaker, because I'm not sure where everyone's coming from, but I'll just share just a few of the things I've experienced as, as trying to get people to, to pray for Israel. The first one, the big one, is indifference. Okay, why do we have to pray for a nation 5,000 miles away the size of New Jersey? Why am I going to spend my... It has no relevance whatsoever to my everyday life. Why am I going to pray for the nation of Israel? Indifference. The second one I see is zeal. Sometimes people get so zealous for Israel, Gentile believers think they have to become Jewish. And God's not calling you as a Gentile to become Jewish. God's, you know, some people think, well, if I'm going to really do this, I've got to do the, these Jewish customs and become Jewish. And I, if you've ever seen some of this, some of, it go, some of it's really, really concerning. Some, some believers have felt as if they've got to go under the Torah again. And Paul warned in Galatians, don't come back under the law. And I've even heard of people who got so zealous for Israel, they rejected Jesus Christ and went back under the law of Moses. So God's not calling you as a Gentile to be Jewish. Okay? So I just want to say that. Third one, offense. If people get offended because they view Israel only through the lens of politics and polarization, and they only view Israel through the lens of the way the Israeli government is handling the, cur the current crisis with pa the Palestinians, and they're offended either by their politics or by their religion. So I'm not coming from that view. Naive. Some people, I fell into this when I first started learning about Israel, believe, okay, Israel is God's chosen people. That nation is God's chosen land, his promised land. Therefore, Israel can do no wrong. <laughs> Israel's government is just as corrupt as our government, and our government is very, very disgustingly corrupt. <laughs> so don't be naive. Just because God has plans for the nation of Israel does not mean the Israeli government is anything of pure and moral. They're absolutely not, just like our nation is absolutely not. Don't be naive. Confusion. Number five, confusion. Some people, again have embraced replacement theology, which is really big in the church. It's been in the church since almost the very beginning of church history. In fact, 
you could even trace the Holocaust to the writings of Martin Luther. And Hitler actually used the writings of Martin Luther to fuel the flames of the Holocaust. It's all throughout church history. You, you can just read about it. That, that the church has, thought, has bought into the lie, and it is a lie from the pit of hell called replacement theology that says all of the prophetic promises given to the nation of Israel now belong to the church because they have crucified their Messiah. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is replacement theology, and it has confused the church. The sixth one, this is a new one for me, but I've gotten a, a number, a handful, of, a few people that have made this comment to me as I've taught on Israel, a conspiracy theory. That Israel is, is not an act of God. It is a modern day creation of the Rothschild Illuminati uh, work. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that, but people that, have, that believe that have been reading and listening to too many podcasts. Get back into the scriptures. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. They believe that Israel in its modern form was instituted by an elite cabal of Jewish bankers who have an intention, evil intention to rule the world. They view all Jews as, as corrupt Zionists who want to take over governments, banking, and religion. Truly, you may think that's funny. People really believe that. Okay, have I offended everyone yet? Number seven, unnecessary. God is far more interested in the heart of humans than he is some piece of land in the Middle East. I agree with that. I totally agree with that. God is far more interested in the hearts of, his, of people all around the world than he is about a plot of land in the Middle East. However, that does not mean that the nation of Israel and the land of Israel is unimportant. God made a covenant and gave his vow for that nation to Abraham. From the borders of Egypt all the way into Iraq, I am giving this land to your people. The land of Israel is important. It's not enough just to preach the gospel. We definitely need to preach the gospel, but God has prophetic promises for the land of Israel. In fact, he calls the land of Israel his land. And Jesus Christ, has uh, this land has been given to him through covenant. The covenant was made with Abraham and with his seed, Jesus Christ. Paul said that clearly in Galatians. That land, the nation, the nation of Israel, is God's land. It's not even the land of the Jewish people. It's the land of Jesus Christ, and he's given it to the Jewish people. It's his land. And if it's his land, and we're believers in Jesus, then we should also be concerned about his land. Would you agree? So, here's where I'm coming from in this message. Okay, I'm not coming from any of those perspectives. We've got to go higher. We've got to come up higher. The Lord says, uh, the Lord said to John, come up here. We've got to come up higher and view this from a new perspective. As I'm coming from this, I want us to experience God's heart for Israel and the Jewish people as God's word reveals it. I want us to see Israel and the Jewish people from God's perspective based on his word. I want us to be gripped, gripped like Daniel. Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, was gripped with the prophetic promise to Israel, gripped by that promise, and he labored in prayer for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people in Babylonian captivity to go back to the nation of Israel. I want us to be gripped with God's prophetic pur purposes for Israel, and I want us to be burdened with God's heart like Daniel, like Esther, so we can be effective intercessors in this time and season for such a time as this for God's purposes to be accomplished. I want us, I want this church to be forerunners who partner with the Lord and prepare the way of the Lord for his, his second coming to the nation of Israel. I want us to be faithful in this assignment. The next thing I want to say here is God is not about to act, or God is not acting on behalf of Israel because of anything they have in themselves. God is not acting because they have a special bloodline. God is not acting because they're his favorite son. In fact, God says in Ezekiel 36, 22, he says, he told Israel, it is not for your sake that I'm about to act, but it is for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations. 
See, God is not about to act in this prophetic hour we live in on, the, on, the, uh, on behalf of the nation of Israel because they've kept the Torah. They've done some great work. God is acting. This is what I want us to get. God is acting for his namesake. God is acting for his namesake. His holy name alone. So now let's talk about why pray for Israel? I got 11 reasons and your eyes start rolling. Oh my goodness. So we'll, we'll unpack these here. But number one, God still loves Israel deeply. And this is where I think we got to come from in this issue. If you love the Lord, it's not enough to just love what you love, but to love what he loves. And more, more specifically, to love whom he loves. God has a heart for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. He always has. He always will. Gomer was called, or uh, Hosea was called to marry a prostitute, Gomer, to symbolize God's heart for Israel. That even though Israel is unfaithful and pursuing many other lovers, that Gomer as, or Hosea as a prophet would be this prophetic model of the heart of God for Israel that even though she ran to other lovers, Hosea would never betray her and he would be faithful to her always. Well, that's just an Old Testament thing. God's still not like that. Hosea chapter 2, 14 through 23 tells us very clearly, no, God is going to allure the nation of Israel in the wilderness. That's an end time prophecy. And he's going to betroth Israel as a nation to himself in faithfulness. See, many, many Christians quote Isaiah 49, 14 through 16, that God has inscribed you on the palm of his hand. But that promise was not made to you. I'm not saying you can't apply it. You can. That promise was applied and spoken to Israel. Now again, we can apply that. Don't mistake what I'm saying. But the Lord says in Isaiah 49, 14 through 16, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a, but the Lord says to her, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. God has not forgotten the nation of Israel. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Zechariah 2.8 says that he who touches you, speaking of Israel, touches the apple of God's eye. The eye is the most sensitive part of the body. Israel and the Jewish people are very sensitive subjects to the Lord. If you touch Israel, you poke God in the eye. See, I don't think there's anything more important as we prepare for these 21 days of prayer for the nation of Israel. Nothing is more important than having God's heart for Israel. Paul in Romans chapter 9 through 11 was so gripped with God's heart for Israel, he said, I wish that I was accursed. I could wish that I was accursed so that my people Israel might come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is, I, I can't even comprehend. I would, I would almost wish, that, it's like Paul said, I would almost wish to go to hell if it meant my brethren could come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is an incredible expression of the heart of God for Israel. He was not, that was not a natural love. That was God's love. God's love for the nation of Israel. So as we prepare for these 21 days of prayer for Israel, Carrying the heart of God for Israel and the Jewish people is very, very important. In fact, if we don't have his heart for this, our prayer times are going to be really, really boring, dead, and dry. I've been in that. I've been in Israel prayer times, and after five minutes, you're like, okay, we're supposed to pray for an hour. we got 55 minutes left, and we've prayed every single thing we know to pray. And I've been there like, oh, God, what are we going to pray? I'm sure some of you have been there. What are we going to pray? It comes with having God's heart for Israel. God's, God uses these words to describe his, in the scriptures, to use 
to paint a picture of what his heart is for Israel. He says that Israel is precious. Israel is exceedingly jealous. My delight is in her. You are my desire. You are my chosen. You are my sought out. God has called Israel's father, keeper, and shepherd. And so there's actually six things that the scriptures say about God's heart for Israel. Number one is God's heart for Israel burns with desire. God's heart for Israel burns with great desire. Number two, God is exceedingly jealous for Zion. We talked about that at the very beginning when we prayed. God is exceedingly jealous for Zion. Number three is God's heart for Israel overflows with love and compassion. Number four, God's heart is filled with mercy. Number five, God is steadfast in faithfulness. Now, all these are in the notes on the YouTube, so if I'm going fast, they're all in the notes on YouTube, so you can go back, and I would encourage everyone to slowly read through these notes just to get it in your heart and, and to look at the scriptures to get that stirred in your heart, that God's heart for Israel abounds with goodness. So that's the first one. Why pray for Israel? Because God still loves Israel deeply. Number two, why pray for Israel? God has chosen Israel as his servant to bless the world. And that choosing has not been undone by their rejection of Jesus Christ as Messiah. Paul said that in Romans chapter 11, I think it's verse 28 and 29. Paul said that the election, he said, the Jewish people for, are enemies for, your, for the sake of the gospel. The Jewish people, by and large, are enemies of the gospel. But Paul said, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers and for the sake of his election. God has chosen Israel. Israel is God's servant. Even in her blindness and her hardness, which by the way, God is the one who's done it. You would not be saved. Paul says this in Romans 9 through 11. You would not be saved if God did not take the hardness and the blindness of Israel and take that hardness and further that hardness so the Gentiles could be grafted in. You would not be saved if God did not do that to his chosen servant Israel. It's a great mystery. Paul said it was a great mystery. Paul said, I tell you a mystery that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I mean, why pray for Israel? Our salvation is because God in his sovereign choice, Romans chapter 9, in his sovereign choice because who has the right to say to the potter, what are you making of me? God took the hardness and the blindness of Israel in the rejection of Jesus the Messiah and he furthered the hardness like he did to Pharaoh and he says, I will harden whomever I harden. God did that to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles, you and me. We're saved because of God doing that to the nation of Israel. It's a mystery. I can't explain how that all works. It's a mystery. Paul said it was a mystery. But Israel is God's chosen servant. God, and the, the calling of God is irrevocable. Sometimes people use that scripture to say, well, you get these spiritual gifts and you can use them even if you fall away and all this stuff. And they quote Romans 11. Paul was saying that about the nation of Israel. The calling of God and his election are irrevocable. Isaiah said in Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9, he said, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. Just, just capture the language there. Chosen. When God chooses someone, he never unchooses someone. God has chosen Israel. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remote parts and said to you, listen, the Lord says, the Lord says prophetically over Israel, you are my servant whom I have chosen and not rejected you. Even though God's people, by and large, well, not by and large, but a good number of people have rejected Israel, God says, I have not rejected you. I have chosen you, and you are my servant. God 
has used Israel to bless the world. He told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. In fact, Paul quoted, uh, Paul quoted in uh, Galatians chapter 3, he said, when, when God told Abraham and you all the families of the earth will be blessed, Paul said that that was fulfilled in the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the nations of the earth have been, fulfilled, have been blessed through Israel, God's chosen servant. See, even now, this is probably something new to you. We'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we're talking about how God blesses the nations through Israel, his chosen servant. Listen to this. This is a really interesting verse of scripture. As the Lord said, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Nations come into alignment because of the nation of Israel. I'm not saying in every case, but I want to give you a modern day example of this. In 1946, before Israel became a nation, there were 74 independent countries. Two years after Israel became a nation, there were 89. But listen to this. By 1995, there were 192 nations that, that were created. That is remarkable. That means 103 nations declare their independence in a mere 45-year period. God used the nation of Israel, putting her into her, her proper place to bless the nations of the earth. God has chosen Israel as his servant to bless the nations of the earth. Now, I just want you to hear this. In Romans chapter 11, verse, starting in verse 11, Paul said that, I say then that they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their, their fulfillment be? He says in verse 15, their rejection is the reconciliation of the world. Now, this, this is what he says. Because of Israel, God's chosen servant, and he's using her to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles, Paul said that, that through Israel, his chosen servant, God using that chosen servant, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Riches for the world have come to the Gentiles. Riches for Gentiles has come. The reconciliation of the world and the fullness of the Gentiles. What, I mean, man, just thank God for what he did. Because we would not, I mean, I don't know how all that works. I'm just reading what Paul said. Number three. God has chosen his servant to his servant Israel to shake nations and empires. God said in the Abrahamic covenant, the one who curses you, I will curse. I'm just going to take in those Hebrew words just to kind of speed up the time here. I'm just going to substitute and just say what that, those two Hebrew words mean. Is the Lord is saying in this, and the, the details are in the notes, is the one who makes you small, the one who treats you in a trivial way, or views you as insignificant, I will curse. And you can just study world history and see how God has fulfilled that covenant. When the Egyptians mistreated Israel, God devastated Pharaoh's mighty army. When Amalek went to war against Israel, God said, I will war against Amalek from generation to generation. When Assyria and Babylon came against Israel, God eventually destroyed those nations and they never, never to rise again. When Haman wanted to eradicate the Jewish people, Esther stood in the gap and said, expose the plot to the king. And, and God, the, the, very, the very gallows that were intended for, her, for the Jewish people, God hanged Haman and his ten sons on those very gallows. You can just look at world history. You can look at the Spanish Empire and the British Empire, when they mistreated the Jewish people, God removed their prominence to some degree. You can just look at that. It, it is really a staggering thing. God, because of the Abrahamic covenant, has chosen his servant Israel to shake nations. That's why 
Zechariah chapter 12, the Lord says that, that I, have, I have made Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the surrounding nations. If you attack that nation, beware, because God's covenant with Abraham has not ceased or been voided. It is an eternal covenant. God uses the nation of Israel to shake nations and empires. Number four, the, the fourth reason why God tells us to, or why it's important to pray for Israel is Scripture commands us to pray for Israel. Scripture commands us to pray for Israel. David said in Psalm 122, verse 6, is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, what I just read, Isaiah said, give him no rest and take no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. We have a mandate to pray for the nation of Israel. Number five, God has a prophetic destiny for the nation of Israel that will be fulfilled. Replacement theology is a doctrine of demons. It is inspired by hell for Satan to try to stop God's prophetic agenda. It is not going to succeed. Replacement theology is a doctrine of demons. God has a prophetic destiny for the nation of Israel that absolutely will be fulfilled. See, think about this. The Lord said on the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I came to abolish the prophets. So we always focus on the law. We never think about the prophets. The Lord said, do not think that I came to abolish the prophets. I did not come to abolish the prophets, but to fulfill the prophets. Well, he's only fulfilled just a small part of the prophets. You read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Zephaniah and Zechariah, and you don't read it from the way we typically go to it from our own lens of our own self and our own American mindset to say, okay, what's this saying about me? God's not speaking to you in the prophets. Now, I'm not saying you can't make an application of it. You can. What I'm saying is we go into this with this lens on that says, okay, Israel means the church, Jerusalem is the bride, whatever, and we miss what God was speaking to the nation of Israel. The prophets, this is especially true in the charismatic church who doesn't understand the Old Testament prophets. Really, anyway, I'm not going to go there. I'll get off on a bunny trail there. But the Lord has not abolished the prophets. When we come to Matthew 24, when we come to the book of Revelation, unfortunately, and what has come to known as preterism and amillennialism or postmillennialism, grounded in replacement theology, basically the prophecies were, were fulfilled in 70 AD. That's completely false. That's not true. Or this idea that we're living in the millennial kingdom now, God help us if we're living in the millennial. I, I don't even understand how anyone could possibly think that. How in the world could you possibly think we're living in the millennial kingdom right now? That's insane. <laughs> I mean, I've got a lot bigger view of God than that. I mean, if we're living in the millennial kingdom now and the church and the, Jesus is ruling through his church right now, man, he's not doing a very good job. <laughs> That's false. That is absolutely false doctrine. But it's come, all those teachings, that false teaching that's come, has come because of replacement theology. Because the church has said, Jesus fulfilled the prophets. So when we read Matthew 24, and we read the book of Revelation, read it from the lens that these prophecies that were spoken by the Old Testament prophets have yet to be fulfilled. And you can look at end-time prophecy. End-time prophecy is Jerusalem-centric. All of the prophecy spoken to Israel is Jerusalem-centric. Daniel 9, 24 through 27, all of that is spoken specifically to the nation, to the, to the city of Jerusalem and to the Jewish people. Matthew, or Daniel 9, 24 through 27, one of the most unbelievable, remarkable prophecies that predicts not only 
This, listen, this prophecy predicts the exact timing Jesus would be crucified. 400 something years in advance. A profound prophecy that is centered around Jerusalem and the Jewish people. End time prophecy is Jerusalem centric. Everything flows out and ripples out of that Daniel 70 week prophecy. You know where we get the term, the, the seven year tribulation or the great tribulation? That comes from Daniel's 70 year prophecy. It's Jerusalem centric, it's, it's related to the Jewish people. Number six is Jesus is returning to Israel and he's going to reign from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. I'm sorry, Americans. To tell you this, but Jesus is not returning to Washington, D.C. I'm not sure Washington, D.C. is going to survive the tribulation and the wrath of God. I don't think it will, actually. That's another, another topic. But he's not coming to Washington, D.C. His feet are coming. His, his, he's coming to the Mount of Olives. He's coming to the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is returning to Jerusalem. It's the only, listen, Jerusalem is the only, the only city in Israel is the only nation whose destiny is secure. America's destiny hangs in the balance. Not Israel's. It's absolutely secure by covenant. He's coming to Jerusalem. And, and, and when he comes, every single city of the earth is going to give their allegiance to the King of kings and Lord of lords. They're going to go up to the mountain of the Lord of hosts, and they're going to entreat his favor. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord of hosts. That is not the church. I have heard charismatic teachers talk about, well, we just need to be the church, and nations are going to come to us, and they're going to bring the wealth of the wicked to us. Those prophecies are about Israel. They're not about the church. And they're about when Jesus comes back and rules... Sorry, I got a little excited. <laughs> Yeah, my iPad after I'm done preaching is, needs to be wiped down with wipes. <clears throat> but when Jesus comes back, the nations of the earth are going to stream. It's actually, it's actually paradoxical because nation, uh, the rivers stream downhill, but the nations are going to stream uphill to the mountain of the Lord of hosts to entreat his favor. And in fact, if they don't come, Zechariah says it'll bring a curse on their nation. It won't rain on their nation. Jerusalem is called the city of the great king. And, I, and in, in the scripture I read earlier, uh, Zechariah said that I am returning to Jerusalem. Jeremiah 3.17, I'm going through these fast. Just re, you can read it all through the notes slowly. I would encourage you to do that. As at that time, they will call Jerusalem, I love this, the throne of the Lord. Jesus Christ is going to have his throne in Jerusalem. And all of the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord. He's going to reign and rule for 1,000 years from the city. Kings and queens. You know, we saw the coronation of King Charles yesterday. Actually, I didn't watch it, but it was on. I sat it like I sat there with popcorn and watched the whole thing. I didn't watch any of it. But all the nations of the earth were focused on that coronation. But there's coming a, a king who's going to be the king of the entire earth. And his throne will not be in London. It will be in Jerusalem. And when he comes, kings and nations and prime ministers... And governors will come to the, that mountain, to the throne of the Lord, to, and seek his, to entreat and to seek his wisdom and counsel for what they need to do in their nation when he rules and reigns for a thousand years. The capital city of the kingdom of God is coming to Jerusalem. See, I, say, I, I listed five things just real quick I'll run through. That when Israel, when Jerusalem is appraised in the earth, when Jesus Christ rules and reigns from Jerusalem, Israel is going to be the worship center of the entire world. Israel is going to be a nation of priests that are ministering to Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Number two, Israel is going to be the place from which God's glory shines into the nations. I love what Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 24 or Isaiah 27, one of those, says that when the Lord reigns from Mount Zion, the sun is going to be ashamed. The sun's going to be ashamed because the glory that comes out 
from Jesus Christ ruling from the city of Jerusalem, the sun is going to be as if, like, I have no light that even compares to the glory that comes from him. God's glory is going to shine out from the city of Jerusalem. Number three, Israel is going to be the place from which divine blessings, favor, prosperity, peace are released into the nations. Eight, it talks about in Zechariah chapter 8 that, that eight people from the nations are going to grab a hold of one Jew and they're going to say, let us go with you because the favor of God is on you. Whereas Israel right now is a byword among the nations, a reproach among the nations, that's going to change in the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back. Number four, Israel is going to be a place of unspeakable joy and gladness. The joy of the whole earth is going to be Jerusalem. The joy of the whole earth is going to be Jerusalem. Number five, Israel's borders will extend from Egypt into Iraq when he rules and reigns. Now, that ain't going to happen until he rules and reigns. That would create World War III. But when he comes back... What God promised to Abraham will be fulfilled. The borders will extend from Egypt into Iraq. Number seven. Is the cov all the covenant promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In fact, in one of the most, this is, if, if you don't get anything else out of what I'm talking about the, here, get this. Isaiah chapter 49, verse three. This is very important to get this. Because sometimes when we talk about Israel and the Jewish people, people get their focus off of Jesus onto the things of God. Don't make that mistake. I've seen people that get so zealous for Israel, they actually, their zeal for Israel eclipses Jesus Christ. The person is replaced by the things. Don't make that mistake. But hear this prophecy which Isaiah said, this time he's not speaking to Israel the nation. He's speaking to Israel the Messiah. Catch this. Huge. Isaiah 49.3, he says to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ, you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. Jesus Christ is Israel. He is the expression of what God, God intends for Israel. Jesus Christ and the covenant promises spoken to Abraham, and I would say the covenant prom, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, all the prophecies spoken in the prophets. God, uh, Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, the promises, he was talking about the Abrahamic covenant, but all that's contained in one thing. The promises were spoken to him, to Abraham, and to his seed, which is Jesus Christ. It was not spoken to Isaac. It was spoken to the seed, which is Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, he is the rich root of the olive tree of Romans chapter 11. Jesus Christ is Israel. And all the promises that we enjoy as believers, they were not spoken to the church, they were spoken to the house of Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. All that we've been talking about in dwelling life, those covenant promises and what God has done to put the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of you, we just experienced before that before the majority of the Jewish people. That's taken from Ezekiel chapter 36. It was a promise spoken to Israel because of their unbelief. The majority did not experience that. We are experiencing and we've been grafted into the promises God made with Israel. You've been grafted into the rich root of the olive tree. Some Jewish people have been grafted into the rich root of the olive tree. But Paul says, you are a wild branch. You're grafted in contrary to nature. But they're grafted, they're grafted, in, they're grafted in according to nature. And Paul says, if they don't continue in their unbelief, they'll be grafted back in. There's a lot more I can say about that, but I'll, I'll speed up for the sake of time. Number eight, and this will be my last point before I take our break, <clears throat> is that Israel is God's land and the Jewish people are his people. Joel chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord says, I will be zealous. This is, a, this is an unfulfilled prophecy. 
The Lord says, I will be zealous, the Lord will be zealous for his land, and he will have pity on his people. The land of Israel and the Jewish people are the Lord's people. See, how could he say that? Romans 8, 28 through 29 says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice or God's election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. We'll go ahead right now. We'll, we'll stop this this, this first part, this will be part one. And so we'll, we'll take a five-minute break. I'm going to time it. If you're watching us online, just uh, all you're going to see is this background here. While we take a five-minute break, i got to give everyone a bathroom break. i got to give people a chance to get something to eat. But uh, we'll, we'll take a five-minute break. We'll come back and do part two. Amen. is a vapor.
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and jump back into part two of this message. Thank you for your patience. I, I really appreciate it. You're doing really good. Uh, no one seemed, uh, not, not too many people have zoned out yet, so I thoroughly, it makes me, makes preaching easier when you're not looking bored. So I want to encourage you in this next session not to look bored. Even if you start feeling bored, just, just, actually, I'm going to watch, just watch Linda because she's just on pins and needles. I'm just going to, if I just 